So welcome, um, Bill. Um, you are a founder of your own consultancy um, and I've done a lot of work in um, many of the different kind of large brand names, US um, based. Um, I found, uh, with over 70 patents to your name, not all in IoT, I know. Um, but um, we met um, while working um, in IoT for a couple of large um, kind of um, enterprise businesses. Um, why don't you just start um, by introducing yourself a little bit about your background and, um, and how you got into IoT? Sure. So my name is Bill Versteeg. I'm a consultant in the North American, um, mostly network operator space in the area of IoT. Uh, so one of the, the questions I get sometimes is how long you've been in IoT. Well, it depends what you call IoT. I, I started my career a long time ago getting data out of a wind tunnel to a data processing system. And if you squint enough, that's kind of IoT. It's moving data around. And then I uh, wrote the TCP stack for uh, North American set-top boxes. So we networked about 100 million uh, cable TV set-top set boxes back to, we didn't call it the cloud at the time, but you know. So that, that's kind of IoT. But IoT proper, I started doing it about six years ago, and Laura went about five years ago. So we've been um, kind of changing the definition of IoT as we go. It's been a, it's been a good ride. So you talked there about IoT proper. How do you describe IoT then? And compared, because you're you're totally right. Some people talk about anything that's connected to Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, things that have been wired to the Ethernet cables twenty years ago. Those are IoT, but there's now the you're right. The the definition is changing or evolving, and so how do how do you define it today? So the area I specialize in, and the one I think about the most, is um, low power devices not wired. So low power wide area network stuff. Um, I think that's kind of the sweet spot for what the next round of innovation is going to be in. Um, the area you're more with than I am in the, you know, how much water is in my corn is, is going to be a hot area. But there are hundreds and hundreds of use cases that you just can't, simply can't afford to run um, power and or an ethernet cable out to these devices. They're, um, you know, they send a, a measurement every hour, every day. And you, um, there's a lot of use cases that are um, designed to do kind of old school distributed networking, but in the low power mode. A lot of people think about LP when exactly that, once an hour on the hour, you send a piece of data. Um, there's a lot of opportunity now for send data at this rate if you're um, in a good state, and send data at this other rate if you're not in a good state. Um, I'm a hobbyist woodworker, and I've got a kiln that I built that dries wood. And as long as it's working right, you only want to know, you know, once an hour, maybe once a day what the temperature is. But if the temperature goes out of range, you want to know right now so you can go fix it. And, you know, for wood, it's not a big deal. But for stuff like keeping um, temperature on um, foods and pharmaceuticals, if it's between the two set points, 35 and 40 um, degrees uh, Fahrenheit, once an hour, just tell me what the temperature is. But if, it, if you get an ex excursion, you really want to know right away. So um, the kind of the, the IoT that people think about is the basic LP WAN, low power water network. But there's a lot of room to move up market from that and make things work better. Great. Okay, so if we then kind of talk about um, the ecosystem that exists today and kind of different businesses and how they could use IoT. So you're you're very much in it you work with it you understand the the very technical details but where you are you have also helped people who want to move into that space who want to invest in that space can you talk a little bit about how you help those those people think about iot and, and help fit within the business context sure so the um one of the big things about iot is you can do a lot of stuff but just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. Um, and at least in commercial deployments, as opposed to um, other endeavors that are not designed to, to turn a profit, you really need to understand um, where the money flows. If, for instance, you have a project that um, is within a company and the company has an, an ongoing line of business and a new line of business, and the new line of business, its goal is to disrupt the old line of business, the money has to have a way to flow from the old line of business to the new line of business. And if you don't have um, 
the people who control the, the revenue stream interested in changing the way that revenue stream works, doesn't matter how good your mousetrap is, you're going to um, you have a hard time uh, pushing that rope up a hill. Yeah. Uh, a good example is we had a, um, without naming any company names, we had a, uh, a system in which we were deploying a large number of, of relatively inexpensive network devices. And in order to extend that network to include a lower WAN network, we had a very small uh, cost adder to that device to add a lower WAN gateway to it. And you know, a very small number to a very large, a very small bomb cost, bill of material cost adder to you know, 100 million devices in the field, let's say it was 10 bucks, 10 times 100 million, do the math, that's a big check. Yeah. So the people who control the budget for that didn't really get on board with our lower WAN deployment because it was a really big number. Um, the alternative is to spend a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks, a thousand dollars per gateway to deploy them. So the the kind of the new team had to spend a lot of money to build a bespoke network instead of leveraging kind of the, the ongoing installation of other equipment just because of the way the money flowed internally. And uh, it's, it wasn't a technical problem, but it really got in the way of, of a, a really massive deployment. But you do touch on something quite important there that if you're playing in a small scale, then these things are, are okay. You can test this gateway, you can test this device, you can buy 10 devices, 100 devices. But when you're kind of working with the companies at the scale you're talking about, you are talking about deployment at state level within the US, even wider than that. And um, you're also talking about um, millions of devices. Um, and then you've got quite big, um, when you're putting in an infrastructure, do you invest in the infrastructure or do you invest in the flexibility? Um, what, um, and I, actually this is one of the things that's um, the, the reality of the industry today which is actually how mature some of these options are. And when do you place your bets? And um, do you have any advice for anyone coming in today and, and kind of the, the key things to look at or to really consider um, when making some of those big choices? Yeah, so there's two ways to deploy a network. There's, you can deploy a bespoke network that does, for instance, monitoring of mousetraps. Um, if you're monitoring mouse traps and your targets are um, large, um, you know, Fortune 500 companies that have warehouses, let's say. So you would go to those Fortune 500 companies and you'd sell them a small gateway. They would place it on their premise and then you'd sell them mouse traps. You'd bundle as a service and you'd charge them, you know, per rat trap or however you wanted to charge them. And that's all fine and good. And that's a good way to make uh, money in a vertical. However, when you then want to go uh, address a market adjacency, let's say in addition to that, you want to monitor temperatures in um, fast food restaurants. So now you got to go sell gateways to people in fast food restaurants and sell them temperature monitoring stuff. And now you got two networks right next to each other and they're kind of ships in the night. Um, another way to do it, um, perhaps, would be identify a customer that has the superset of your connectivity requirements within a, a region let's say water meters or gas meters in South Korea is a great example. So the, the folks in South Korea found a use case that kind of paid for itself. You know, if you could have enough oomph to uh, say every gas meter in Korea is gonna be measured via LoRaWAN, we're gonna build a network and it's gonna pay for itself in some number of years. So now you build a facilities-based network on outside gateways with uh, the capability to first monetize by monitoring gas meters. But now that you've built a nationwide network that's able to touch really hard to reach devices, well, now you can go sell all the verticals and not have to go install additional gateways. So the, the advice is find a use case that'll pay you the freight, or at least come close to paying the freight, yeah. get that to work and then layer on. Uh, in North America, people have postulated that might be water meters. Um, that's a fairly fragmented industry though. There's so many municipalities that have water meters, same with gas, same with any vertical. So a, another approach would be to, um, the derogatory term is build it and they will come. Yes. And people don't like to hear that because if people, they don't come, well, you just wasted, you know, some tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. However, the, the first broad deployer, at least in North America, of a, an inexpensive LPWAN network, whether that's LoRaWAN or NBIoT or what have you, 
is going to really make a bunch of money. It, it may be a manufacturer of um, personal assistance. You know, here's a, once again, without naming names, here's a device that had backhaul and it has wide deployment in homes and industries. I happen to know what it costs to add a LoRaWAN gateway to something like this, and it's maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe $7. Yeah. For a company that's well funded and willing to, to invest, you know, once again, some tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to establish an eight, a nationwide um, inside out, if you will, lower wind deployment, there's money to be made there. Same with uh, cable TV providers, same with um, any provider of a service, a retailer of TVs, a um, who knows, the sky's limit, doorbell, you know, ringers. Um, HVAC equipment. The, the first person to really deploy that way will have a, a first mover advantage. Now, having said that, um, a lot of the cable company, excuse me, the telcos are starting to roll at NBIOT. And yeah. given proper investment in that space, that'll be a really nice deployment. You got to chase the money though. And right now, the average revenue per user, ARPU, for making phone calls and surfing the web is much greater than IoT devices. So, the phone companies are, I suspect, they're going to do their 5G rollout first, and that's going to totally occupy them for the next some number of years. And you won't really see a, um, an aggressive NBIOT rollout for until sometime after that. Now, that's just my humble opinion. They, they may decide there's a use case that they can go after that pays freight and, and go do it. Don't know. Well, it goes back to your business model of the make of the business model by da using data at the moment. Um, and all of the things that we're talking about here are connected devices. That's all about small, small, small packages of data. Yep. So, so there, you have to have extremely high numbers then to make the revenues work in the existing business model. Exactly, because we're um, kind of in the, in the IoT space right now, we're kind of selling transport wholesale and we're not really addressing vertical markets. Um, for instance, what they did, my understanding in Korea, is they're not selling wholesale data transport to people who provide meter reading services. They're providing meter reading services. So the, the amount of money that the, they're able to put into their budget includes the person that used to walk around reading the meters. So yeah. they're capturing the value from the bottom of the chain to the top of the chain. And, and as most people realize, the, the farther you are up the value chain, the better the margins are, but typically. Yeah, absolutely. And actually it's about thinking really holistically rather than maybe just replacing one thing with one thing. It's changing the system. It's redesigning rather than yeah, just... And, and at the engineering level, um, you got to be really careful that you get the bits and the bytes right. But even if the bits and the bytes are right, if you're not addressing the, uh, the marketplace at the, the higher value levels, it's, it's going to be an uphill battle. Okay, so let's just change tact a wee bit there. So now... So we've talked about kind of then that's quite big system thinking with quite a lot of, like it's a high stakes game, so to speak. Um, you know, do you deploy at this level? Do you take, so there's still quite big tactical or strategic decisions to be made. But let's talk a little bit about the people or the skills and the competencies that a business needs in order to really survive at, at the moment and then be able to transition to, to not only survive, but thrive. Um, when we talked about kind of leadership styles or, um, you, you know, the, the, your style is, is often coming in as an individual to help a business transform. Um, again, what kind of skills are you looking for within those businesses that you work with, those champions to really um, kind of give a project, an IoT project, the highest chance of success? So, um... To be frank, I haven't seen many successful large-scale LP WAN deployments. Yeah. So I'm going to refer back to um, something predates IoT. It's um, a business, uh, IPTV, uh, where there was an existing um, installed base of traditional video providers, very facilities-based, very uh, set-top box, very uh, capital-intensive. You acquired a customer and you put a, a couple thousand dollars into installing equipment in that premise, and then you, you, you rode that by getting as much as you could from that customer for video services. Um, way back when, people decided, well, we can disrupt that 
if we have, um, you know, bring your own, bring your own broadband and over the top video. And the, the leadership in that space was able to, um, outside of the, the, the constructs of the existing cash cow, both external to cable companies and satellite providers and internal, we're able to say, hey, that, that thing is going away. It doesn't matter if we do it or somebody else does it. That, that's a downward facing revenue stream. Another great example is when the telephone companies were landline companies. In North America, there, were, there was one company and then there was seven, but they all were heavily invested in, in running copper to your house and then charging you line items to, on your phone bill. And then there was this wireless thing came along. And fortunately for the North American cable companies, they embraced the wireless and became the wireless companies and transformed themselves. Similarly, in the IoT space, there are companies that view themselves as providers of um, rodent control. And the way they provide rodent control is they have a staff of people and they go out and they, you know, sell door to door and they have some guy once a month go check the rat traps. And these people have built their little empires and their um, status within the company sometimes boils down to how many people they have in their staff. And if you go to them and say, hey, I can help you reduce OPEX. How do I do that? I fire a bunch of people. You have to find someone who is able to say, well, rather than um, reducing your staff, we're going to allow you to charge more because we're going to relieve your staff of the burden of checking empty traps. They're only going to go out when the trap is full, interact with the customer, upsell them by giving them you know, the gold service. Yeah. However you do that, you need to find someone with the understanding of the business and the willingness to either disrupt themselves or know enough about the business to disrupt somebody else. Yeah, and it's um, also thinking about um, rather than delivering individual things to be really increasing layers and layers of service and using the data. But right. Another good example is when we uh, go deploy traditional networks and we want to layer in a Lauren network on top of those networks. One of the, the benefits is you can use the LoRaWAN network to monitor the legacy network and you can um, increase the quality of service on the legacy network by knowing when and where there's an outage. And when we first started talking to the people who operated those networks about these benefits, we, we cast it as an OPEX savings. You yeah. don't need so many people. Well, that didn't work because they're not necessarily interested in reducing the size of their staff. Yeah. So we made a, a, a bit of a pivot and said, well, rather than reducing your, um, your OPEX, we can increase the, decrease the downtime and decrease the mean time between failure and the network and provide a better service to the end customers and thus reduce your OPEX due to doing you know, bulky repairs. Yeah. Don't change the size of your staff. Increase the uptime by an order of magnitude of the network. And, and that got a little better reception. Which is then of value to their customers. That's correct. Now, so, it's hard to put that into a spreadsheet um, and justify that to senior management. So you have to, have, once again, you have to have the, the business people who are the champions. And the champions have to understand how to, to drive the system and make things happen. Yeah, so it's a bit of politics. A bit of um, business. There's people in there too. It's the humanness of it, and then it's yeah. the under deep understanding of your customers and what they value, and a bit of a mixture of all. And you need all four or five of those things. You know, if you have all the above, but you can't get the bits through the network, it, it's it, it's um in the chain is what you have to address. Yeah, it's a really good. Now, now, having said that, some of these use cases are just slam dunks, and you don't need to have you know all the ducks in a row because, uh, you know, uh, reading water meters remotely, there's just so much friction in the existing system that you can do it, you know, I don't want to say half-assed, but you can do it in a, a um, very pedestrian manner and this project will still work because there's just so much upside. Absolutely. Okay, so let, let's, let's also then pivot on further and talk then about, um, is new people come into this space or begin thinking about making investments here about how to get started? What words of advice have you got for somebody who's starting a, a project, whether it's internal, large scale, doesn't matter, but somebody who's getting started with an IoT project? 
So I would say don't reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of resources out there that are, um, you know, pre-canned. There's a lot of open source code. Um, the, the vendors are happy to help the customers prototype, um, give them the, the wisdom of their experience. Um, you know, there's a thousand ways to do a project, 990 of which aren't going to be very good. There's 10 that'll work nice. Um, just go ask somebody in the industry, a vendor or a friend, um, their advice on, on how to get it done and avoid some of the pitfalls. Okay. And talking about pitfalls, is there any kind of key learnings that you have or things that you would do differently or, or we think about approaching differently? Yeah. So I'm a technician. So I'll talk about some of the technical details. Um, be careful about battery life. We um, had a couple false starts where some, you know, bugs in code and perhaps some, some suboptimal design decisions made battery life an issue. Um, you know, if, if you have a spreadsheet that says a sensor lasts three years and here's your payback and your first initial test, the battery only lasts a year, well, you got some explaining to do. Um, but the, those issues have, by and large, you know, this is a six-year-old problem. This is not a problem today. This is a, an old technology problem that, that you just had to be really careful with batteries. You still have to be careful with batteries, but that's, you know, blocking and tackling now as opposed to innovation. What else? Let me think. That's the big one. Um, systems integration can be a challenge. Once again, don't go off and do something crazy. Follow the standards work with reputable vendors. Um, here's a plug for engineering services. If, if you don't have the skills yourself, hire a consultant to go help you with it. Um, a lot of it's turn the crank now. You uh, decide what, what you need to get done. You pick the right sensors, pick the right network server, pick the right gateway, and then just turn the crank on making it happen. Cool. Okay, and, um, and just any um, final words that you want to just pass on to someone else about kind of a, an approach or, or a way of working when they also come in. So that's the kind of technical issues, but just the kind of attitude or energy that people need to have in this space. Yeah, so the, I've found um, over a quite long career that innovation is often found in the intersection of two areas that are moving quickly. Um, computer networking and digital video. Um, network management and the internet stuff like that. But right now, what I see is um, IoT, when I say IoT, I really mean LP WAN, and healthcare, uh, or LP WAN, and um, making work safe, making the environment um, safe for employees and customers. So just as advice, you can tell from my hair and my scruffy beard that we're in the middle of um, the coronavirus lockdown. Um, there's gonna be a lot, a lot of opportunity in that space, um, because both healthcare, and the workplace have some really big needs right now. And the IoT space has some, some tools that can be brought to bear and it's gonna move really fast. And people who are able to move fast, deploy quickly are gonna both help the situation very importantly and, and as importantly, you know, make some money doing it. Thank you so much, Bill, that was great. And a really nice kind of positive uh, piece to finish with there. And let's see what happens in this space in the next few months. So. Great, thanks.